Greetings, church family. This is Seth Lehman. Some call me affectionately Pastor Seth. And I'm coming to you with our final video in this series that we've been doing on hope. And it's entitled, The Blessed Hope. It's a look at hope with reference to eschatology. Hope with reference to final things or the return of Jesus Christ. I hope that this study will be an encouragement and uh, provide your small groups with a great time of discussion. But I want to begin with a question. Here it is. Do you have biblical hope? Okay, let me repeat that again. Do you have biblical hope? Now, before you answer, let me carefully review with you the difference between biblical hope and worldly hope. Biblical hope is the confident expectation of good things to come for you as a believer because of Christ, God's Son. Okay, so that's biblical hope. Biblical hope is the confident expectation in good things to come for you as a believer because of Christ, God's Son. Now, compare that to worldly hope. Worldly hope, or hope as it's often defined by those that live around us, is simply this, a wish, a desire, or an expression of what they'd like to see happen. It could be expressed by your fingers being crossed. You hope that it rains. You hope that uh, the coronavirus continues to fade. Biblical hope is being confident that today's present sufferings are being worked out by God for your future good and glory. Okay, that'd be an example of biblical hope. I'm confident that everything that's happening in my life right now is being worked out for a future and ultimate good because of God. A worldly hope, that's an optimism uh, that the stock market will in continue to rise or uh, that your preferred presidential candidate will be voted in this November. That would be worldly hope, a wish, a desire, an optimistic thought. So the question is, do you, do the folks within your small group, do you possess biblical hope? This supernatural confidence that good is coming your way in the future because of Jesus Christ, God's Son. I hope that you can answer that with a confident yes. But I think another question that we could ask, and maybe it's a follow-up question, is how does a person develop, or how do they enter into this biblical hope? How does a person uh, cultivate this confidence in the future good that God will do for his people? because of his son? And I think this is a good question because all of us, if we were to be honest, and if we were to think biblically, we would understand that we entered into this world lacking confidence, lacking trust, lacking faith in God. And so there's a sense in which it is not natural for me to hope in God. No, I doubt God. I disbelieve what he has said. So how can I be confident in what God will do for me through Jesus when by nature I do not trust God or believe in his goodness? That's what we're wrestling with now. And I think a great answer springs from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. This passage reminds us that biblical hope is a supernatural consequence of the new birth. So let me read it for you. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why this passage is so important is because this passage links the living hope to the new birth. 
Because it's not natural for you and I to have this confidence, this hope, this expectation. That's why we need the new birth. That's why we need a new heart. According to Peter, the living hope is the result of the new birth, and the new birth is the result of God's special mercy being poured out to you. So those of us who have been born again, truly, by the Spirit of God, those of us who now believe on God's Son, we possess a new heart. And one of the characteristics of that new heart is that it has a living hope. It naturally trusts God. Its nature or bent is to believe in a Christ in whom they've never seen, to long to be present with this God who has made them come to life through the Spirit and through the work of Christ. So, those who have been born again by the Spirit possess a new heart that does trust God, that does believe in His goodness, or with reference to our lecture tonight, that does hope in the biblical sense of that word. Those who haven't been born again, and I suppose that could be you, those who haven't been born again, lack hope. Uh, you can't fake it till you make it on this one. Uh, there is no confidence, no much, matter how much they try to work up a confidence, because that confidence comes from the new birth. I hope that's coming across clearly. Perhaps you can dis discuss that further when the video ends. Additionally, and I think this is interesting for you to think about, additionally, those who have been born again through faith in Jesus actually grow in biblical hope as they strengthen their heart through God's word. Listen carefully now to Paul in Romans 15, verse 4. Here's what he says. For whatever was written in former days, referencing the scripture, was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Did you catch that? So, so the new heart gives me a capacity or an orientation to hope, and it's the scriptures that build or grow or strengthen or cause to come to life the new heart that I possess through the Spirit of God. So any believer who desires to grow in biblical hope needs to look no further than taking up his or her Bible, taking it up and reading it, feeding your believing heart, you might put it that way, and watch as you will grow in confidence or in biblical hope with reference to the good things to come through God's Son. So, having wrestled with what is biblical hope by way of review, having also wrestled further with how do we develop hope, recognizing we can't develop it, it's a gift of God, it comes through the new birth, which is made available to us because of Christ, through the Spirit, to all who will repent and believe. Our focus now in this video will be on answering the question, why does the believer have biblical hope? Okay, why does the believer have this confidence that good things lie in store for them in the days to come? I mean, a person could push back a little bit and you could say, Seth, have you watched the news lately? Seth, do you have any understanding of history? It doesn't look like good things are coming. A potential second wave, a potential stock market or dollar collapse, a, a potential election in the fall, w whatever frightening circumstances that you might be confronted with on a daily basis, you, you might say, why would I be confident that there are good things in store for me in the future through God's Son? Another way of framing this question would be this. What exactly does the scripture teach concerning the future of believers that fuels their hope or confidence in a better day to come? And that topic, the topic of future things, the topic of final things, 
is what we in theological discussions refer to as eschatology, the study of final things, the study of end times, eschatology. And so in this study or video, we're focusing on how our hope is really rooted in eschatology. For our purposes tonight, I'd like for us to center in one passage, Titus 2, 11 through 13. This passage will guide us, and I'm going to read it for you now. Follow along. I think the words will be on the screen. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Now pay close attention to this. Waiting for our blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in this passage, Paul reminds Titus, and by way of us, the readers, he reminds us, that God's grace has already appeared to us once. That's a reference to the first coming of Jesus. God's grace has already appeared to us through the first coming of Christ, and because Jesus came, lived, died, rose, and ascended into heaven, we through faith have been set free from our enslavement to sin, and we're now empowered to live a disciplined life characterized by godliness in this present age. That's verse 12 in a nutshell. But notice how Paul describes our present condition in light of God's grace appearing. I'm looking at verse 13 here. We have a life that we can live now characterized by self-denial, self-control, and waiting, looking. There's an expectation. Expectation. There's a hope for a blessed hope. So in other words, this is a large part of our motivation for living. Our confidence in a blessed future. And then, by way of apposition, he reveals to you and I what our blessed hope is. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is kind of interesting. For the Christian, we really have two motivations for living. On one hand, we follow Jesus in light of what he's done in the past. Our love for him is rooted in the grace that he poured out to us on the cross. And yet, there's another sense in which we follow Jesus because of our love for him with reference to what he will do for us in the future, his appearing, his coming, his return. There's a sense in which Paul, in this text, anchors our hope in a future reality, the promised and second appearance of Jesus Christ, or you could put it more simply, Christ's return. So why is the believer confident in good things to come? Well, a simple answer is the scriptures are very clear. Christ promised to return, right? At the end of the Gospels, promised to return at the beginning of Acts, after he ascended, promised to return. And all throughout the epistles, there's a confident expectation, hope, or promise that Jesus Christ will return. The book of Revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of his glory as he brings the fullness of his kingdom in the final days. I want you to listen for a moment to a really cool comparison and paralleling. This was done by a man by the name of David Guzik. And he's comparing and contrasting the first coming of Jesus with the second coming of Jesus. And as he does this, I think it will remind all of us why it is that we anchor our hope in Christ's return. So now I'm going to quote from David Guzik. Jesus came the first time to save the soul of man. He will come a second time to resurrect the body. Jesus came the first time to save the individual. He will come a second time to save society. Jesus came the first time to a crucifixion. He will come a second time to a coronation. Jesus came the first time to a cross. 
he will come a second time to a throne. Jesus came the first time in humility. He will come a second time in glory. Jesus came the first time and stood before Pilate. He will come a second time and Pilate will stand before him. Jesus came the first time and was judged by men. He will come a second time and judge all men. End quote. Christians are confident in good things to come because they're confident in their good king. To come. And when he comes, according to scripture, that is the moment when he unleashes the fullness of all the blessings and promises which he's made to us, his beloved. Listen to the following summary. I'm going to read now from the London Baptist Confession, 1689. And I want you to pay close attention. I believe we'll put this on the screen for you so you can follow along. But this works through the doctrine of what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns. And I think this will stir up a confident expectation in good to come for you. Number one, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ, to whom all power and judgment is given by the Father. In that day, the apostate angels will be judged. So also all people who have lived on earth will appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and receive a reckoning according to what they have done in body, whether good or evil. Number two, God's purpose for appointing this day is to manifest the glory of his mercy in the eternal salvation of the elect and of his justice in the eternal damnation of the reprobate who are wicked and disobedient. For at that time, the righteous will go into everlasting life and receive fullness of joy and glory with everlasting rewards in the presence of the Lord. But the wicked, who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, will be thrown into everlasting torments and punished with everlasting destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Number three, Christ desires that we be firmly convinced that a day of judgment will come both to deter everyone from sin and to comfort the godly more fully in their adversity. For this reason, he has determined to keep the day secret, to encourage people to shake off any fleshly security and always be watchful because they do not know the hour when the Lord will come. And so that they may always be prepared to say, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. I thought that was a great summary from the London Baptist Confession. If you've never read the Confession before, you ought to look it up and read it. Uh, it has a wealth of spiritual truth concisely and succinctly compiled for our edification and benefit. Now, brothers and sisters, we cannot forget all the good things that are waiting for us, that will be ours upon our Savior's return. You could summarize it into three basic categories. First and foremost, the wicked will be cast out. And there ought to be something in your heart that longs to see evildoers punished, that longs to see sin and oppression removed from this earth. And that's coming. That, that day is getting ever closer. And it will be ours when our Lord returns. N number two, the righteous are rewarded. I know this appeals to your heart. Right now, it's not easy to live godly. It's not easy to walk contrary to culture. It's not easy to stand strong in the face of so much adversity. It's hard. It's fatiguing. It's costly. Oh, but friend, there's a reward coming, and we're confident of that, and that reward will be ours. That joy, that glory, that presence, the kingdom, it will be ours in its fullness when our Lord and Savior returns. And then number three, broadly speaking, God will once again dwell with mankind. And the scriptures end with a new heaven and new earth, very similar to the way that they began, the creation of the first heaven and earth. Genesis 1 and 2 contrasts 
beautifully with Revelation 21 and 22. And so I wanted to kind of bring our session to a close by reading from Revelation 21. I think there's no passage of Scripture that awakens our hope as believers who have the new heart, that believing orientation. There's nothing that feeds our spirit better, perhaps, than Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. Listen carefully as I read. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Praise God. Death shall be no more. Hallelujah. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. Glory to God. For the former things have passed away. Amen. Continuing, verse 5. And he was sitting on the throne and said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And it's a beautiful passage, friend, that... that ignites such hope, biblical hope, within our renewed hearts. I'd like to close out this session with a charge to believers. Listen carefully. I'm going to borrow from the words of the author of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28. Listen carefully. It is appointed for man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So Christ has been offered to bear the sins of many. He will appear a second time. Did you hear that? He will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin. He dealt with sin at the cross. But to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Did you hear that? According to this passage, who does the return of Christ save? And the author of Hebrews says, those who are eagerly waiting for him. You see, a longing to see Jesus, a longing for his return, a desire for his rule on this earth is one of the primary evidences that you've been born again, that you possess the new heart, that you're truly his. This is part of the new heart or the new way of thinking that belongs to every man or woman who's been born again by the Spirit as a result of Christ's work upon the cross. You have hope today because of God's grace. Brothers and sisters, let's walk in that blessed hope in such a way that others would take notice, that others whose lives are characterized by darkness and despair, others who are convinced that the only dark days lie ahead, may they see in us a stark difference as we're convinced that the meek truly will inherit the earth. Now, if you're watching this video and your life is characterized by a lack of confidence in good things to come, man, I want to appeal to you. I appeal to you in this video and by way of all the preceding videos, I appeal to you you need to look to Jesus. Only Jesus Christ can give you biblical hope. He alone is able to give you a new heart. For he alone, through his cross work, has provided a means for your new creation. He came, he lived, he died, he rose, he ascended. And because of his work, the Father through the Spirit, can grant new life and true confidence, true belief to you. 
So I urge you, cry out to him right now, uh, wherever you happen to be watching this video from. Ask the risen Jesus to cleanse you of your sins. Ask the coming King to grant you a new heart of faith, to love him, to obey him, and to believe and look forward to the good that he's promised for those that eagerly wait for him. Along with a new heart, as a bonus, he'll give you that confidence. He'll give you that hope in good things to come, good things that will be yours on the day of his appearing. Brothers and sisters, so much of our hope is rooted in eschatology. Our conviction that our King is coming again, that all will be judged, that the dead will be raised, raised unto life, through Jesus, raised unto death as a consequence for rejecting him and living a life of unbelief and sin. May these things stir up your affections for him, and may they help you have a great small group discussion. Thank you so much for paying attention to this series. We're looking forward to developing more small group videos and unifying curriculum in the days to come. God bless.